Important concepts. This video does not really have a logical order. It's a collection of just random things that I want to finalize a mathematical basis behind before we move into electromagnetics. Let's just jump right into this. Right-handed coordinate systems. Up to this point, when professors have drawn X, Y, Z on the board, you probably didn't give much thought into the specific directions that are chosen for X, Y, and Z. There might have even been times where the professor drew two of the axes and paused a little bit, maybe stared off into the air before they drew the third one. And maybe you're even wondering, what on earth is that professor thinking? And that professor is probably thinking of what direction that third axis should be in so that the coordinates formed a right-handed system. We've already seen we have things like curl and divergence where there's signs and handedness. And it turns out our coordinates also need to be right-handed or we will end up with some incorrect answers. So in a right-handed system, we think of it this way. Think of the X direction cross product with the Y direction has to point in the Z direction. And so over here, this is actually my right hand, superimpose on a coordinate system here. And what you can see is that the fingers on the right hand curl in the direction of rotating X into Y. And so when you curl the fingers on your right hand that way, the thumb on your right hand points in the Z direction. And so if we get this wrong, we'll end up with minus signs where we don't want them and missing minus signs where we actually want them. Okay, quick example. Here's a coordinate system. Is that a right-handed system? That is not a right-handed system. If we curl the fingers from X to Y, where X rotates into Y, what we'll end up seeing is that the thumb points in the opposite direction than Z is pointing in. My thumb in this case would be pointing downward. So this would be a left-handed system and not proper for electromagnetics. The convention is right-handed system. Flux. Flux is a word used throughout electromagnetics, but in fact, the word flux is not even an electromagnetic term. It's a mathematical term coming from vector fields. And those vector fields can represent any number of things. But what's meant by flux? It's the amount of a field that penetrates straight through a surface. So what we're looking at down here in this little animation, the blue is the field. And this gold surface here is the surface I've defined. And I want to calculate how much flux there is passing through that surface. Well, remember how I defined flux. It's the amount of that field penetrating straight through the surface. So we're only interested in counting the normal components of that field. And the normal components is what I'm showing with the green arrows. The tangential component are the red arrows. So if we add the green and the red arrows, we'll get the blue arrows across the surface. But for flux, it's only these green, these perpendicular components that would be counted and added up. We integrate that across the entire area and that overall sum is the flux. So the tangential components of that field completely ignored, not counted at all in flux. And we can see that in this equation for flux. The double integral means we're integrating over that surface. A is the field that we're analyzing to calculate flux. And then we do a dot product by this differential surface. So this differential surface has a differential area and a direction that is perpendicular to that surface. So when we take that dot product, we're really just looking at the component of A that is in the direction perpendicular to the surface and also being multiplied by the differential area. So that is flux. Stokes theorem. This is a rather mysterious equation that lets us convert a closed line integral into a surface integral where it appears that we're integrating a bunch of curls. 
So what does this mean? Well, let's look at the equation on the left and interpret what's going on there. We're doing a closed line integration. So we choose some path that I'm showing in this black line and it's closed. So it has to form a loop in some way. So it starts and ends at the same point. I'm constantly doing a dot product of the field with this DL. This is the differential length. So as we're moving around the black line, DL is constantly pointing in the direction tangential to this black line. And so since I'm doing a dot product of F dot DL, I'm looking at the component of F that is tangential to the surface. And I'm integrating that all the way around this loop. And so those little tangential components of F is what I'm drawing here with these blue lines. So adding all of these up, that would be the line integral on the left. Now let's visualize what's happening on the right. So the del cross F, this is a bunch of curls. So imagine we divide up our closed area here into a whole bunch of little regions. And in fact, more than this, but it becomes intractable to draw. So we have a bunch of regions here and I calculate the curl inside each one of these. And I'm adding up all of these curls. Now, if we look at the curls and we look at the directions, what we'll see is that take this curl. So it's moving up along the line here, but the other curl is moving down. And in fact, they would cancel out. And what we see is the curls will actually cancel out on all the interior lines. However, they will add up on the outside edge and we're really just left with the picture on the left. So integrating all these little tiny curls throughout a surface ends up being the same as a line integral going around the outside. And we will use this in electromagnetics to convert line integrals to surface integrals and surface integrals into line integrals. The divergence theorem. This is similar to Stokes theorem in that we can convert two different types of integrals. On the left, we have a closed surface integral. So this is enclosing a volume, perfectly enclosing a volume. And somehow we are writing this perfectly enclosed volume also as a volume integral. So let's picture what's happening on the left. F dot DS, this is a flux, right? We just talked about that a few minutes ago. And so we are looking at the components of F that are poking straight out of this surface. We're ignoring any tangential components and we're adding all of these up around the outside. Now let's take a look at what's going on on the right. Here, we're doing a volume integration and we're breaking our total volume up into little pieces of volume. And I'm drawing larger pieces of volume just so we can visualize what's happening here. Well, inside each one of those, we're looking at the divergence of the field. So I'm showing a point here and the field diverging from it. And so we add up all of these different divergences. Again, let's compare these two things and see what's happening. We have the field diverging through this surface right here on the left. The field on the right is also diverging from right to left through this surface, and these two end up canceling. And in fact, the effect is all of these interior interfaces end up canceling because there's just as much field going one way through it than there is the other. And so the only thing we're left with really are these components that are punching straight through the outer part of the surface. And that's exactly what we had on the left. So we can convert a closed surface integral into a volume integral. That is called the divergence theorem. Here is a very interesting identity from vector calculus, and this will arise when we get to electrostatics. But forget that this has anything to do with electromagnetics right now. Just look at this as a vector calculus identity. And let's start with the gradient here. So F will be any scalar function, and we're calculating the gradient of it. And what it says is the curl of the gradient of any scalar function has to always be zero. Now, why on earth is that? Well, let's think about it. Let's start first with the gradient. The gradient of a scalar function 
gives a vector function. And that vector function is pointing in the direction of quickest increase of that scalar function f. So the magnitude will be the slope of f and the direction is uphill. So imagine f being elevation. Then the gradient points uphill and in the steepest possible direction. So this gradient always has to be pointing uphill. What this identity says is then the curl of that gradient always has to be zero. So why is that? Well, <clears throat> let's pretend it's not zero and see if that makes sense. So if the curl of something is not zero, that means that something, that vector something has curl, which means it's circulating about some axis, which then means it's forming loops. So if the curl of something is not zero, then that vector function has to be forming loops. So how can we have something that's always pointing towards increasing values, yet also forming loops? How can that happen? Well, in fact, it can't, and that's why this vector identity is always zero. So there was a famous artist, Escher, who actually drew a case where something is always increasing and yet forming loops. And of course, it's an impossible thing. Escher was a famous artist because he drew these really interesting optical illusions where, in this case, it looks like somebody's always stepping up on stairs, and yet somehow still it wraps on to itself. So this is impossible, and I think this is probably the best illustration I can come up with of why this vector identity has to be true. We can't be always increasing and yet form a continuous loop. So the curl has to be zero because it's impossible to do that. Product rule for divergence. Here is another vector identity that comes up in electromagnetics that appears strange. And here we're talking about the divergence of the product of a scalar function times a vector function. So this product gives us another vector function from which we're calculating the divergence. And this equals the scalar function times the divergence of A plus A dot product, the gradient of F. And how on earth does this equal what's on the left? So let's go through the math and figure this out. So the first thing I like to do is expand A into its vector component. So we also have the scalar function F multiplying each of those. Now we can apply the dot product. So we end up with the partial derivative with respect to X times F A X plus the partial derivative with respect to y of f times a y, plus the partial derivative with respect to z of f times a z. And that, again, is simply just the dot product from above. Now we apply the product rule to each of these terms separately. When we do that, we end up here, and that's how we apply the derivatives, because both f and the x, y, and z components of a could all be functions of x, y, z. So we're not free to just bring f to the outside or bring ax or ayz to the outside of the derivative. So we apply the product rule, we end up here. Now what we do is we rearrange terms. What we see that there's one term with an f on the outside, another term with an f on the outside, and another term with an f on the outside. So we group those together and bring a single f to the outside. And then we have all the other terms that have the vector component outside the derivative. We have one term here, one term here, one term here, and we can group these into a single parenthesis. And then if we stare at this long enough, what we see is what's inside these first parentheses is the divergence of A. So it's F times the divergence of A. If we look at this long enough, what we see is, well, there's a dot product going on here because we see an X component of one thing multiplying an X component of another, Y component of one thing multiplying a Y of another and a Z multiplying a Z. So that smells like a dot product. And then what we're left with here is the gradient. And that's exactly what the second turn ends up being. It's the vector A dot product with the gradient of F. So in fact, this does reduce to what we originally had on the right-hand side, and we've proved that vector calculus identity.